So on to the topic of diversity, which to many of you may feel like has become a real buzzword in 2017. Across the board, we've seen a lot of progress in terms of representation, everywhere from magazine spreads to catwalks, boardrooms, and editorial appointments, particularly at Condé Nast. And yet, we're, still, we're really quite a long way from where we need to be. Um, notions of beauty remain overly exclusive. The balance of power really remains in the hands of a privileged few. So the question, I guess, that we're going to discuss today is, will luxury ever really look like the outside world? Um, and I'm talking to Rebecca today and Eric on this. Rebecca, I thought I'd start with you. Mm. Diversity is such a broad topic, and we've only got 30 minutes. <laughs> How are we going to define diversity for the purposes of this conversation? I think it's a really powerful question to start with. If I were to say to you right now, turn to the person next to you, talk to them about what diversity means to you, with only three examples, what would you choose? Would it be gender? Would it be race? Would it be sexual orientation? But what about ability, disability, age, socioeconomic status, neurodiversity? You know, I think as Lizzie touched on, we could go on and on and on. And I think the point is, there's an entire spectrum of diversity and what we really should be talking about as diversity. And when you think about it, diversity is simply, or perhaps not so simply, which is why we're talking about it today, um, is an output of inclusion. And you know, I've been sitting here in the audience and talking to you over the past two days, and what's been fascinating is how many times, I was tracking how many times the word diversity came up in different contexts. And quite rapidly, it got overtaken by the words include and inclusion, and admittedly in different contexts. But I think it's important today to think about a common language of inclusion as we move forward. I guess the other thing that I'm constantly thinking about covering the fashion business is that we really are an industry based on the superficial. Um, in order to diversity to really have the impact it needs, it needs to be more <coughs> systemic. So how valuable is it when we do have a real uptick, which we do in terms of diverse models in advertising campaigns on runways, when we still don't see that same level of diversity in boardrooms at the moment? So shall I run with that first? <laughs> um, I think in terms of boards, okay, look, there, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is there, is there is some great work being done, and the conversations I've had with a lot of you to, uh, today and, and over the past couple of days have, have, have proven testament to that. If we look at research that's coming out, the research is proving increasingly positive impacts on business and the bottom line. Not so good news is we've got a long way to go. And I could pull out a ton of data sets right now, we all could, and I'm sure you've all got a ton of them up your sleeve. FTSE 100, 77% of executive boards continue to be singular in their representation. That's quite astonishing, 77%. So we've still got quite a long way to go. But I think the next step is not talking about a target. And I love how targets come up you know, many times. I think there are so many words we need to take out of the dictionary this, <laughs> over this session. Um, it's not about a, a simple target of put a woman on a board and let's hope something sticks. Board compositions and constructs are highly complex. And we need to start thinking about diversity of thinking and diversity of creativity. You know, fundamentally, the responsibility of any board, and I've talked to a number of chairs of boards and board, board structures over the years, is to advance the business strategy. It's about governance, it's about resources, it's about driving the, strate the strategic agenda forward. And that's about, about putting the right collection of minds around the table, regardless of all those different facets of diversity we're talking about. And you know what? That takes work. It takes hard work. It takes investment. You know, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence. We're not as clever as the machines that we created. We don't do machine learning as well. So in order to make those board structures work and to make them truly diverse, we have to invest in them. And that means openness, transparency, and collaboration. That's how we're going to really drive this agenda forward and shift it from merely shifting the needle to really changing the game. Eric, I wanted to move to you for a moment. And um, for those of you who don't know, although I know plenty of you do, um, Eric is a star ballet dancer. He was, until very recently, at the Royal Ballet, um, and one of the very few African-American top dancers in the world. And he has recently made the leap into fashion. Um, and he's been shot for Vogue, Givenchy, Samsonite. There's a number of campaigns. In fact, another big one that we'll talk about later. Um, but I wanted to start just by asking you about what it feels like to be uh, defined as a poster boy for diversity, whether in ballet or in fashion, and in some ways both are relatively calcified worlds. <laughs> um, you know, how does it feel then to, to be put in that position? Is it flattering? Is it frustrating? 
I never, when I set out to become a ballet dancer and when I moved into the world of fashion, I never set out to become the African-American one or the one who's representing diversity. I wanted to fulfill my, my talent fully. I wanted to fully just do the best I could and make the most of what I had. I happen to be black. It's not, it's, I'm not here to, um, to sort of take a stand for diversity. I, I haven't done that. Will you just give us a bit of a background? I mean, how did you get into ballet in the first place? And again, what about that move into, into fashion and why you decided to do that? Sure, I, um, at 14 years old, I'm from quite a humble background in Washington, D.C. And at 14 years old, my mom decided I was going to the local performing arts school. She decided I was an actor. I had no experience. And so I got this monologue and I tried to learn the lines. I completely flopped in there and I just, I panicked. Going out to the car to meet my mother, I knew she was going to kill me. So I saw some girls doing splits, and I thought, hmm, okay, I'll try that. I went in as the only guy, became a ballet dancer. I did it for about six months on a probationary period, and then I wound up going off to ballet boarding school, living there, and carrying on and dancing in American Ballet Theater and in the Royal Ballet. During one lunch period at the Royal Ballet, I was out in Covent Garden, and I was stopped by an agent who asked, oh, can I take your picture? I eventually signed with that agency and then carried on into the fashion industry. But you have left ballet now. Yes, I resigned from the Royal Ballet in August. And the plan now is, is fashion full time? Yes, full time. So I've done loads of projects, a few you've mentioned. And also I'd like to do a bit of outreach as well. In what yeah. sense? In what sense? So I went out to Hackney last year and there were 60 young boys about the ages of six to nine, and I went to try and find some ballet talent within the children, and there were two that were really talented. But at that age, you need your parents' support. One of the mothers said, oh, this is fantastic, and little boy is now enrolled in a ballet school in Hackney, which is great, we still keep in contact. And the other mom said, absolutely not. My son is a footballer, ballet is for girls. <laughs> so, okay, well, what are the odds? Ballet dancer, footballer, as a little boy, the odds are a bit higher that he could probably become a ballet dancer. So I feel like that opens a discussion for needing your parents' support in doing something that isn't seen as the norm. And that, I guess, takes it back into the question of diversity in its many different ways, class, race, mm -hmm. age. I guess one thing we could say, and I'd be interested on your feedback on this, is if we do have broader representation in advertising campaigns on, on the public stage, Will that encourage a younger generation to go into behind the scenes in fashion? Will the very fact that they see people like them reflected at them encourage them to go and change the status quo? So I think you touched on a really compelling point, which is really how, how we attract, retain, and motivate talent, which I think is one of the most compelling questions in, in, in business today. Um, and certainly, if, if you're doing it well, if you've got a, a comprehensive strategy that you're cascading across your entire business, then already, in terms of your employer brand, you're hitting it really high and hard, and so you're diverse. You should, you should be showing up a very diverse talent pool. Um, what it does touch on, I think, is a really interesting question around a big challenge that we see probably every, every day in business, whether we're aware of it or not. And I think what's been fascinating, before I tell you what it is, um, how many conversations I've had over the past couple of days where it's come up, which I think is amazing. A lot of people are already doing training in the room. So maybe there'll be, there'll be some questions around this, and that's bias. Uh, there's a lot of research going on right now in terms of unconscious bias, affinity bias. And I know a lot of you are really tapped into, into this already. But very briefly, what it means is we tend to gravitate towards people who are like us. What's wrong with that? It's, it's a natural human instinct. It's a natural human tendency. But if you go back to the question we were talking about in terms of the benefits of, diver of, of diversity, in terms of thinking, in terms of creativity, in terms of innovation, in terms of how we progress as teams and as businesses, over time, that becomes highly constrictive and highly limiting. So I think it opens up a very powerful debate around how we attract, retain, and motivate talent. There are very simple ways in which we can look to, to, to overcome that, but I think certainly you raise you know, one manifestation of a lot of things that we really need to be doing across every single touch point of the brand to make that happen, which goes back to your point that we were talking about last night. You know, it can't be tokenistic, it can't be, token, it can't be superficial. You, know, you can't hit that one target and hope, oh, tick the gender box, that's great. You know, you, we really have to look at what we're focusing on and how we, how we relate that to our brand, our values, and how we cascade it across the entire business. 
if there are particular areas where we think that we're doing well, where are they? You know, I, I think we can safely say that, that women are much more represented now, for example, mm -hmm. on the corporate side than they used to be. You know, do you think brands are doing well at kind of supporting them, particularly yeah. there seems to be a lot of conversation now around support, you know, maternity support. And that yes. retention in the 30s is the key bit. You know, at luxury MBAs now, it's, yeah. it's overwhelmingly a female intake, and yet there's a big drop off mid 30s. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very great, that's a very good point. I think one thing I'd say as we sit here today, what, 200, 250 people? First of all, luxury is not a category. We all represent businesses from a variety of cat categories, whether we're in product, services, or experiences. And I think we've always learned from looking outside our industry, so looking at adjacencies. One of the strongest areas right now where you're looking at good practice, best practice, setting standards, is professional services. Mm -hmm. And I could call out many examples. One business that I'll call out in particular is EY. EY is doing some really amazing stuff because, because they're doing it comprehensively. Processes, roadmaps, tapping into clusters, tapping into communities. And it's so strong that it's creating almost an organic movement within the business. I'll give you one fantastic example of that. You know, you touched on parenthood. That's, that, that, that's, that's a very powerful example. What about the hidden things and the hidden voices? So one of their top, top execs at EY, Ian Wilkie, he'll talk very openly about his journey, and he'll say, I have been lucky because he's found allies and champions along his journey, with or without whom he may or may not have had the same journey. Now, what's really interesting about Ian, he has a stammer. What Ian's done is set up within EY the stammering network for the entire network, the entire global EY network. What's even more compelling, he set it up for the entire industry. And that's when I talk about the difference between shifting the needle and changing the game. How compelling is that? You know, one of the things I find really astonishing about a lot of the people I know in social enterprise, these are some of the most fiercely competitive individuals and ambitious individuals you could ever wish to meet in the entire world. They want to make an impact on the world in the same way that you're making an impact on those individuals. It's, it's fantastic. But you know what they naturally do, do? They lean in. They are naturally and intuitively collaborative. So I think for us, and this, this conversation comes up time and again, we've got PVH in the room, Kerry, Englishmore, um, Tapestry now. What's the difference between what we could be doing as an individual voice, as a brand, and as a collective? You know, and, and I know we're threading into another, another discussion, but I'd like to say this today. Here in 2017, we are 250 odd businesses represented in this room. What if we as a collective committed to changing the agenda today? Come back in a year's time and talk about what we've done, how exciting that could be. Well, again, we've talk, talked about how sometimes it's great to have targets and it doesn't always work to have them as the other issue. I, I, I wanted to talk to you, Eric, also about the shift in power because it feels to me like up until quite recently, uh, the balance of power was that brands often saw a niche in the market, for example, to go after a consumer who felt they weren't represented. But it feels like, to me, especially with social media now, there's a real growing chorus of, de of demand. Brands can't afford now not to represent all demographics. Do yes. you feel that in your interactions with, with some of the brands? Is that things that you talk about, who you're reaching? You've got a big campaign to announce now, yeah. don't you? Yeah. So, um, so I think that the brands have an ethical responsibility to represent the world that we live in. So if, if I think of a brand like something really aspirational, like Gucci, for instance, I can think of a 12-year-old boy who's going to school who really wants a new Gucci outfit. But I can also think of it has such a history that like an aristocrat or someone who's going to walk on a red carpet or something also wants Gucci. And they represent rappers as well. They, they just, um, I feel like they've got it right when it comes to representing everyone and reflecting the world that we're living in. And then, of course, you've got, you're starting from January and at H&M. Oh, yes, H&M. I am um, on a campaign for H&M in January. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I flew to New York. Uh, we shot on a beach in Long Island. Recently? It was freezing. No, <laughs> no uh, it was earlier in the year, and New York stays warmer a little longer during summer. And just also, again, because I'm very curious about this, this permanent move into fashion. Yes. Why? So for me, um, I've enjoyed my time as a ballet dancer greatly, I have to say that. But one thing that I did find incredibly frustrating and I found it slightly challenging as well was this sort of idea that you need to retain tradition so heavily. 
And when I went into fashion, I found that this was actually the opposite. This is a world that's really innovative and looking for something new, looking for something exciting. There wasn't this sort of constant intention to retain tradition, which I think can be really dating and not leave a lot of room for growth. So fashion is incredibly attractive in that sense. I think touching on, on um, Sarah and Vanessa's panel just before and the post-Weinstein era, you know, it, it, there's been a real cultural shift, a palpable cultural shift in the last three weeks as more and more people find a voice. Do you think that this could have a knock-on effect in a, in a positive way in terms of some of the topics that we've been talking about? It's largely been focused on gender, but this could easily spill onto, into other areas. I guess I've got two, two sides of the answer to that question, one of which is, well, I, I sincerely hope it does. Um, I, I think what's rather sad and depressing sometimes is that why does it often take a crisis to trigger us into action? You know, I loved what Francesca, Francesca was saying the other day um, about, you know, you need to be fixing the problems while you're strong and while you're in a good position. So, you know, I would like to come to a point where it doesn't take us a crisis every time to start fixing some of the issues. I guess I was going to say, I, I, I'm sure lots of people have some questions, but in terms of what brands should be doing then, what mm -hmm. did I say if there was to be three targets you know, what should each brand be able to do? I, I put it in really simple terms. So, you know, I think a lot of people probably know the name Interbrand because we value, we've, for the past 18 years, we've been valuing the top 100 most valuable brands in the world, and that's across all sectors. Um, there are three pieces in terms of uh, the data that we use to come up with that final valuation. And the third piece is probably the most interesting. It's kind of like the engine room that's going on underneath the hood. And that's called brand strength analysis. Mm. And that's when we look at 10 components of a brand, six of which are on the outside, four of which are on the inside. And I think that gets us to what we've been talking about again over the past sort of 24, 36 hours around great brands, strong brands begin from within. Again, Francesca talked about you know, her employees are her clients. And those four factors on the inside, their clarity, their commitment, their governance, responsiveness. So the best thing we can do is ensure that we are strong and tight on the inside and we're living and breathing those values that we stand for as a brand, not just at the top company, but at whole company level. Uh, are there any questions? Everyone's always so quiet for me. Everyone's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa, you normally have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could just, if there are specific, you know, one recommendation from each of you about what, um, what should happen next. Eric, maybe you could give one. Sure. I think in order to make the brands, I'm sorry, to make the world a bit more diverse, the brands have a responsibility to represent the world that we live in. So I think, in a sense, you have to, you decide what is beautiful. You decide what is normal. And I think just um, sort of making that a lot more varied, a lot of people are influenced by that, and it will create change. And I guess I thread from that in terms of, absolutely right, what you're doing on the outside. There needs to be a direct correlation in terms of what you're doing on the inside. The two need to come together. And I think the other thing, probably again, um, consolidated and inspired by a number of conversations over the past couple of days is focus. You know, as brands and businesses, we can't be all things to all people. That's the absolute antithesis of being a brand. So focus on doing a few things well that are strategically aligned with who you are, where you come from, and where you want to be going, and, and really excel, blow them out of the park. Great, excellent. Well, we're making up some lost time. Thank you very much. Thank and I'm you. going to welcome Vanessa back onto the stage with Unfunded. <laughs>